Hey all, welcome back to the Real Life Pharmacology Podcast. I am your host, pharmacist Eric Christensen. Thank you so much for listening today. Uh, Go check out reallifepharmacology.com. Snag your free download, 31-page PDF on the top 200 drugs. Uh, I throw out important uh, clinical real-world pearls uh, on that educational piece, as well as things that you're going to see come up on uh, board exams and pharmacology exams and things like that. So a uh, great refresher if you're in practice uh, or if you're in school, uh, definitely a, a helpful resource to help you uh, study and prepare for any uh, exams you might be facing there. So with that said, let's get into the drug of the day today, and that is tolteridine. Uh, brand name of this medication is Detrol. Uh, there is a Detrol LA as well. That's a long-acting or extended-release product. Uh, this class of medication, or the class that tolteridine belongs to, is the anticholinergic class. And more specifically, it's a urinary anticholinergic. And the diagnosis that we're going to most often treat with this medication is overactive bladder. So from a mechanism of action standpoint, uh, tolteridine is relatively selective uh, for the inhibition of muscarinic receptors in the uh, bladder and urinary tract area. So it can definitely help kind of retain that volume in the bladder, uh, which is going to Uh, help you uh, go to the bathroom less, right? So reduce that frequency of urination. That's the the primary goal, reduce symptoms of uh, overactive bladder and symptoms of frequency. From a dosing perspective, uh, we've got the immediate release, two milligrams twice a day, and then the long acting is four milligrams once a day. Obviously, that's an advantage typically to give a medication once a day versus twice a day. Uh, in my experience, it has been a little bit cheaper to use the immediate release, so you might see that. Uh, another situation uh, that you might see the immediate release used uh, is in patients maybe that just have difficulties or challenges at night. So I've seen that immediate release dose utilized at night to try to minimize symptoms there. And then during the day, whether patients don't care, they don't find symptoms that bothersome, uh, maybe they don't need uh, that whole four milligram uh, extended release dose all throughout the day either. So a um, couple of different caveats there that you're you're probably going to see uh, in clinical practice. I did want to mention renal function. Maximum recommended dose is two milligrams per day. If patients have a creatinine clearance less than 30, or excuse me, in the ballpark of 10 to 30. If they're less than uh, 10, there isn't a lot of evidence there, and it's probably recommended uh, to avoid. So again, 10 to 30, creatinine clearance, uh, maximum recommended dose of 2 milligrams. Okay, adverse effect profile. So if there's one thing I would love to teach you and have you ingrained in your head is first, knowing which drugs have anticholinergic activity, and secondly, what are those anticholinergic effects. Uh, With tolteridine, the primary thing that you're going to hear patients complain about is dry mouth, okay? Very, very common. So think about patients that, you know, either report dry mouth or maybe they're taking a saliva substitute type product over the counter. Uh, It's definitely an important thing to ask. Other anticholinergic effects that can certainly happen from tolteridine, maybe a little less common, but certainly uh, can happen. Uh, Constipation, dry eyes, uh, confusion, fall risk, dizziness, sedation, those are all definitely associated with anticholinergic activity. As patients age, this is going to be generally more and more prevalent. Patients are less likely to tolerate the medication as a patient ages. Uh, One last one on the urinary tract. So it it definitely helps in um, kind of reducing the symptoms of frequency and overactive bladder, Uh, but it also can cause urinary retention and exacerbate that. So patients with some sort of obstruction, uh, BPH, 
those type of patients, it could worsen those symptoms. So that's definitely something uh, that you need to assess from a clinical perspective and understand why they're having symptoms and if retention is a major component of their urinary challenges because dolteridine could worsen that retention. Uh, Lastly, I wanted to mention motility of the gut, and that kind of goes in line with constipation. So tolteridine can slow the GI tract, the whole GI tract. So patients with slow motility, and in clinical practice, most often patients with a slow GI tract tend to be patients with diabetes and a diagnosis of gastroparesis. Tolteridine could exacerbate that and make that worse. So they might experience more nausea and stomach upset, things like that. So um, pay attention to that in our patients uh, with diabetes and maybe taking a a medication for motility issues, which I'll mention uh, a medication commonly used in the drug interaction section. Uh, Lastly, you got to remember the prescribing cascade and to look out for that with any anticholinergic medication, and tolteridine uh, is certainly included. So, for example, what is the prescribing cascade? Basically adding drugs to manage side effects from a medication. So, tolteridine uh, could potentially cause some confusion in an elderly patient. That confusion could lead to an inappropriate or new diagnosis of dementia, that could lead to prescription of a dementia medication like Dinepazo, for example. Dinepazo could then lead to uh, insom- or excuse me, well, it could lead to insomnia, but um, could lead to nausea and stomach upset, and that might precipitate a new prescription for uh, maybe an Ondansetron or PPI or something along those lines. So that's a perfect example of the prescribing cascade and why it's so important to assess for adverse effects as well as assess for efficacy because if this drug doesn't do any good doesn't help symptoms of overactive bladder then we should be getting rid of it so we don't cause cumulative effects and more adverse effects okay and i lay out numerous examples of this in my book perils of polypharmacy Um, great read anybody interested in geriatrics polypharmacy and works with those type of patients uh, that's an absolute must-have you have got to learn from that in my opinion so perils of of polypharmacy you can go check that out um, on amazon Uh, let's take a quick break from our sponsor and we'll wrap up with drug interactions if you're in the market for pharmacist board certification study material like BCPS, ambulatory care, geriatrics, BCMTMS, definitely go check out meded101.com slash store. We've got a great list of resources there. Uh, we've also got just question banks as well. So if you just have study materials for your exam, but you want to test yourself. Uh, We've definitely got just question banks as an option as well. Uh, In addition to 20 plus hours of uh, webinars, study materials, statistics, regulatory topics, um, we have gone through the content outlines of each of these exams uh, and really honed in and, and tried to tailor all of our content for your specific exam. So go check that out. Support the sponsor, meded101.com slash store. Uh, if you're not a pharmacist, uh, definitely go check out meded101.com slash store. We've got a growing list of books, audible books, paperback, ebooks. Uh, all these are resources meant to help practicing healthcare professionals. Okay, They're really, really geared towards that. So go check out the list there. Uh, your purchases there directly help support the Real Life Pharmacology Podcast. And I'm obviously uh, greatly appreciative to those of you who have taken the time uh, and your uh, money to do that. All right, so let's wrap up with drug interaction. So I mentioned that prescribing uh, cascade example with uh, Dinepazil and Tolteridine. So Dinepazil and Tolteridine kind of oppose each other from a mechanism, mechanism of action standpoint. So tolteridine is going to blunt or reduce the effects of denepazo, which is used again for dementia. Uh, Another potential drug interaction, CYP3A4 inhibitors. So tolteridine is broken down uh, by CYP3A4 to a significant extent. 
So by blocking that enzyme, you're going to potentially raise concentrations and run into more adverse effects from tilteridine, like dry mouth, constipation, dry eyes, and all that good stuff. So examples of CYP3A4 inhibitors, especially the strong ones, uh, clarithromycin, uh, there's some HIV medications like ritonavir, uh, some of the azole antifungals like ketoconazole. Remember, that's systemic therapy, not necessarily topical therapy. Um, so those are some examples of CYP3A4 inhibitors that could raise concentrations of tilteridine and put you at more risk for adverse effects. Okay, I mentioned uh, GI motility. So if we use a drug like metoclopramide to stimulate gastric motility, GI motility, tilteridine could blunt or block the effects of that medication or oppose its uh, effects. So that's a, a drug interaction to definitely pay attention to. Again, most commonly probably in your diabetic gastroparesis patients. And then we've got to think about anticholinergic burden. So basically drugs that add on to the side effect profile of tilteridine. So in my mind, other anticholinergic medications. Uh, older antihistamines like diphenhydramine, for example, hydroxazine, uh, tricyclic antidepressants. They are notoriously anticholinergics. That would, that would be a drug like amitriptyline. Uh, some of the older skeletal muscle relaxants like cyclobenzaprine, that can have some uh, modest anticholinergic activity. And we can really have cumulative effects from numerous of these medications being used together, which is going to inevitably increase that risk for those adverse effects that I talked about there. All right, so I think that's going to wrap it up for today. If you enjoyed this episode, do a huge favor. Leave us a rating review on iTunes. Uh, share us with a classmate, student, anybody who could benefit from pharmacology education. And of course, go support our sponsor, meded101.com slash store. Uh, I alluded to the Perils of Polypharmacy book. Um, great book, great resource. Uh, I'm getting really solid ratings for it. Um, I've, I've incorporated tons of real life case scenarios and situations that I've actually seen in my clinical practice. So uh, go check out that book, Perils of Polypharmacy. Uh, if you're looking for study materials for board exams like NAPLEX, BCPS, Ambulatory Care, BCGP, BCMTMS, or the Psychiatric Specialty Exam, uh, again, we've got those resources listed at meded101.com slash store. If you want to reach out to me, uh, mededucation101 at gmail.com, or you can track me down on LinkedIn, which is usually uh, the social media platform that I'm most active on. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for listening, supporting the spot, this podcast. Uh, I hope you have a great rest of your day.